Yeah, it has started recording, so welcome back. And uh, today also we will uh, do uh, very minimal things. We will uh, introduce absolute continuity. Last time, what did we do? In the last class, define variation is total variation. Total variation of a complex measure, and uh, what uh, and it becomes a measure, right? We proved that it is a measure. We have to prove additivity. And what is the surprising result about total variation, which also we proved? Finite. It is automatically uh, finite. It's automatically bounded. Yeah. And there was this uh, elementary lemma, no, which I said uh, I was I had forgotten, which we had to use, right? Yes. Reverse yeah. triangle equality. Yeah, reverse triangle inequality. Not quite in the sense. It says on a on a subset that you are uh, summing on the left side, and the right hand side sum is the full sum. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, it, that's a good way to remember. I think sir, right. this inequality was once once was asked in TI first. Is it again? I think this inequality you have hmm. uh, shown us in a lecture was uh, given in TI first to prove. That. Oh really? In the in exam? subjective exam in sub in subjective exams yes. Oh, I was there in uh, TFR uh, Bombay to. Uh, and did you do that? Uh, no, sir. I, I tried it, but that. Yeah, but uh, there is a trick. In Rodin, there's a nice proof. Uh, so if you have not seen the proof, maybe. Sir, uh, yes, sir. Yeah. I, have, I have seen that uh, first time. So I was just. Uh -huh. Yeah. Of course, I did not try it myself. Maybe one can experiment with. Uh, of course, if uh, only one number is there, then there's nothing to prove. So one can try for two and uh, see all possibilities. It should be possible to do. Maybe not as a nice proof, but uh, it should be doable. But of course, in an exam, you know, there is time pressure. There so. exists such an, so it should be done. Yeah, yeah. Because it is not for all ends, so there should be just some. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure one can try on one zone and reach somewhere. Maybe not such a great proof, but some proof uh, should be possible. It's an elementary result. Anyway, so uh, yeah, but it's it's uh, it's quite nice that pi coming up there nicely. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, today we will just uh, introduce absolute continuity and one or two related notions. And uh, I left uh, Radon Nicodem. I thought you know if I it's a it's a very nice proof. So I thought we will do it in the next class because one can start and try to finish it in one class. Okay, so let me start uh, sharing the screen. So let me get my uh, slide. And start sharing the screen. Uh, who's going for this uh, chess thing on Sunday? Sir, I'm saying. Suraj. Sir, actually it's from department side, so we have to, five people have to be present. So our you and anyone else from our class? No, sir. Um, so those are from MSC or maybe some. MSC, okay, okay. Anyone from BS? Not sure. Uh, no, sir. Most likely. MSC, okay. Okay. So I have given this uh, wrongly. I thought I will add Radon Nicodem, so I will change this. Okay. So Radon Nicodem we will do only in the next class. Uh, so. Uh, uh, but mostly, you know, I will be uh, revising some things that we have done earlier. I also thought it's a long time ago, so some of the proofs we might have forgotten. I myself had forgotten. So let's uh, recall. So this is page 12 of lecture 2. Can you kind of guess what this is about? Lecture 2. Long back and S must be what? Simple function. Simple, simple function. Simple and measurable. And therefore you can write it like this, right? And you can write in such a way that the AI is a disjoint. No, that's our standard representation, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. So uh, alpha is are the points in the range, and then you will choose these AIs in a disjoint fashion so that this is a finite sum of characteristic functions. And if we consider phi of e to be integral s d mu, what was the result? Can now you can guess the result? Not guess. I mean, you have done it long back. You can remember the result. This is miser. It's a measure. Measure. And and the, yeah, so you have to prove that it's countably additive, right? And uh, which was easy because uh, it's a simple function. So there's no theory required, right? It can be directly done. 
So if E is a disjoint union of ER, then phi of E is uh, E is a disjoint union of ER. So phi of E is integral S D mu and E is a disjoint union of ER, right? So only AI intersection. Uh, what is this? This is the, this is this step is uh, you are applying the definition, right? So it is integral over E summation alpha i chi a i d mu. So summation comes out. It's a finite sum, right? So summation alpha i mu of a i intersection E. Now E is union of E R. And therefore you will have union of A i intersection E R. And uh, that's all, no? So mu of AI, in, and, and you're using the fact that mu is additive, right? Mu is additive, so you get this, and uh, this is same as uh, phi of ER because you have uh, changed the order of summation, right? And uh, changing the order of summation, you got this. So this is a measure is clear, and uh, phi is not identically infinity was observed. And then uh, this measure is denoted by this is all recalling d phi is s d mu. And uh, we said that we will soon see that d phi is f d mu is a measure. What is the difference between s and f? S is simple and f is non negative measurable function. Any non negative measurable function, right? So for any measurable f. And uh, then we said that uh, there's a converse which is called the Radon Nikodin theorem. And the key thing to remember is the notion of a measure being absolutely continuous with respect to another measure, which we will introduce today. And this is the next lecture. So next lecture, we actually proved F D mu is also a measure, right? So now what was the point? So if you take F D mu, then how did you show this is a measure? Do you remember the keyword? Now we had to use a result. Simple, you know, it was just change of sum. Again, here also change of sum only, but uh, it needs to dominated, dominated convergence theorem. Well, not dominated, no, MCT. Maybe. No, I think we used monotone convergence theorem. Yes. Yeah, maybe interchanging we use, right? Anyway, let's see. So phi of e is the integral of chi EF. That's just the definition. And then what will you do? Then uh, this is same as integral over x chi er f summation d mu, right? Because e is union of er. Agree? And now you're using interchanging. So summation integral chi er f. This interchanging required MCT, right? The proof of interchanging required MCT may be applied multiple times, at least twice, maybe more. Okay, and this is same as. Uh, phi of ER and this used interchanging, which used MCT multiple times. You remember this, no? When we go through this, we have done all these things. So this is a measure and MT set it is zero, so it's a measure. And uh, do you remember this? This new measure phi is F D mu, D phi is F D mu. So what is integral G D phi in terms of mu? Integral of GFD. 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 So just put the notation D phi is F D mu, just put that there and the correct notation. It is true because you verify it for characteristic functions. Integral G D phi, if G is chi E, it is phi of E, which is nothing but this by the definition uh, and which is this. So the identity is true for simple measurable functions because it's a finite sum of characteristic functions by linearity and apply MCT uh, to conclude uh, in general. OK, so this also we had done. Now let's introduce absolute. Of course, you know this, but let's introduce uh, XM is a measurable space and you have two measures. OK, one is a positive measure mu and the other is. I have written M2 something. So what does this mean? Other can be any measure, so something can be and either yeah. numbers or zero to infinity or real numbers, whatever it is, doesn't matter. OK, lambda is an arbitrary measure, but mu is a positive measure. OK, this is the situation and this is a notation for. 
What is the meaning of this? Lambda less than less than mu. Absolute continuous. Mu is absolute Lambda continuous. Lambda is absolutely continuous with respect to mu. So what you have to remember is, given mu, a natural measure which is absolutely continuous with respect to mu is F D mu, right? So that is what you should remember. So what is the property of F D mu? If mu of e is zero, then uh, F D mu of e is also zero, right? Yes. yes. F D mu, I mean the measure phi. So phi of e is integral F D mu. Integral F D mu over e. If measure of e, mu of e is zero, then integral F D mu over e is zero, right? So that is absolute continuity. So lambda is absolutely continuous with respect to mu, meaning if you have a measurable set of measure zero, mu measure zero, then lambda of e is also zero. OK, so if e belongs to m and mu e is zero, then lambda e is zero. Then we say that lambda is absolutely continuous with respect to mu. So given mu, can you give an absolutely continuous measure with respect to mu? Yes, phi. Phi is equal to integration e. Yeah, so take FD mu, that is absolutely continuous. Question is, can you give something which is no? So how many have you given? You can take F as you like. So you have given infinitely many such measures, right? If you can vary, no? Yes, sir. Change, change, change so, F mu. Mu lambda will change. Yeah. Uh, say it again. I'm saying you give me an F and I have given you F D mu. That's a measure. If you give me another F, that F D mu is another measure. No. Different. Yes, that's why. Yeah, so you have given me so many measures which are absolutely continuous with respect to mu. But the question is, can you give me a measure which is not of the form F D mu for any F which is absolutely continuous with respect to mu? Basically, the answer is no, and that is. Radon Nikodim. Radon Nikodim theorem. Okay, so we will come to that. Now let me also define this notion of singular. Have you seen this in MSc? When do you say two measures are mutually singular? Yes. No, You've seen no. it. Okay. So the basic notion is lambda is concentrated on A. This English word itself is suggestive of something, right? What is the meaning of concentrated on some set? For example, you know, before coming to the definition, you know the Dirac delta measure, right? Yes, sir. What yes. is the Dirac Find delta point. measure? Point. At a point, so let's say take a point x naught. How would you, how do you define the measure delta x naught? Measure will be zero if x naught is not on that set, and then will be one if x naught is there. Correct. If in your on whatever sigma algebra you have, if the set contains a point x naught, it is one. Otherwise, it is zero. That's a measure. You can check it's a measure. Now suppose you have the word concentrated, and I'm not even telling you what the definition is. But still, if I ask, where is this measure concentrated? What will be your answer? You don't know X the not. definition. You don't know the definition of concentrated. Even then, you will say X naught is the answer, right? Yes. Yeah, so somehow, you know, English itself tells you it is concentrated at X naught. So what is the definition? Definition is on A, it is concentrated if lambda at E is lambda of A intersection. Only A matters. Only the intersection with A matters. The rest doesn't matter. OK, so this should happen for. This should happen for. Each all all e, e. all measurable E. OK, and this is equivalent to saying. That whenever E intersects A empty, whenever E is outside A complement, measure of E is zero. Do you see that these are equivalent? One way is obvious, other way is also obvious. One way is very obvious. If the second condition is given, then the first condition is automatically true, no? Because lambda of empty set is zero, right? Yes. Sir. What about the other way? Suppose you know lambda e is given to be lambda of a intersection e for every e. How do you prove that uh, if in e intersection a is empty, then lambda? No, other way. Suppose it is given that lambda e is zero whenever e intersection a is empty. How will you prove that for every e lambda e is lambda of a intersection a? Right, equivalent means that no, if and only if, right? Yes, sir. 
So how do you show the other way? Second statement is given to you. Lambda is zero whenever E does not intersect E. And now you take an arbitrary E. You have to show that Lambda E is Lambda of A intersection. So what's the obvious thing to do? You can write E as union of A intersection E and E is same as E union E intersection A union E intersection A complement. E intersection A complement. E lambda is a measure, so lambda of E will be lambda of A intersection E plus lambda of A complement intersection E, right? Intersection. And therefore, if the result is true, what do you have to show? Lambda of A complement intersection E is zero. Zero. And now that is clear, no? Because E intersection, A complement intersection E is. No. Uh, correct. E intersection. What is our set? Our set is E intersection A complement, right? Yes, yes. So yes, it will be. Just e planned. intersection A complement. Intersection A is, of course, empty. Right? E intersection A complement, intersection A is empty because A complement intersection A is empty. Therefore, lambda on E intersection A complement is zero. That's what you had to show. Clear, no? Yes, sir. So this is equivalent. Can you give me, uh, suppose I give you a measure mu. Uh, let, let, let me take a measure mu and uh, let me take a measurable function f and let me give you the measure f d mu. Can you give me one set where uh, it is concentrated? The measure f d mu, where is it concentrated? First of all, let me ask you, is it possible that lambda is concentrated on A and lambda is concentrated on B with A not equal to B? Or concentration is unique? I think uh, it should be concentrated at one set. Why? Because this equivalent definition, if you look, concentration at A just means Whenever you take E out, E inside A complement, lamp, it has to have measure zero. That's all that it means, no? Any measurable set outside A complement should have measure zero. That's the meaning, right? Yes, sir. So if you take any B containing A, if B contains A, then B complement is contained inside A complement. No. Uh, complement contains E. E outside a complement measure should be zero. That's the meaning. E outside a complement. So suppose you take B so that B complement is B complement contains a complement. So what is what does that mean? B complement contains a complement means B is contained inside A, right? No. You have a you have a set A A and you take a subset B then B complement is bigger than A complement, right? Yes, sir. Now, if you take a measurable set outside B complement, no, outside B, inside B complement, so that's not what I want. I want to say that if you take something in B complement, it should be part of A complement. So you want B complement should be contained in A complement. So that means A is contained in B, right? So if you take B, if lambda is concentrated on A, and if you take B containing A, then it's true that lambda is concentrated on B also, no? Is that correct? Okay. If B contains A, and if E is in A complement, then E is in uh, B comp, no. If, if, if B contains A, then B complement is contained inside A complement, right? So if you take E in B complement, then E is automatically in A complement. Therefore, lambda of E is zero. So lambda is concentrated on B also, right? Yes. 
so for example i am saying that dirac delta function concentrated at 0 is also concentrated on the set 0 comma 1 that is true no if you take any set which do not contain 0 and 1 in particular it does not contain 0 and therefore measures 0 so on a bigger set it's concentrated okay and uh, we are going to define so what is the what is the word here lambda 1 perp lambda 2 means what lambda 1 and sir why it is concentrated on it means if there is a set which is uh, which contains okay. what is concentrated once again what is the definition this is the definition so if e belongs to a complement then lambda of e is zero right if e is contained in a complement then lambda e is zero that's the definition no yes yes now i am saying that you take b so that b complement is contained in a complement okay now if e e is contained in b complement because b complement is contained in a complement e is contained in a complement so whenever e intersection b is empty e intersection a is also empty therefore lambda e is zero yes sir got it okay so you say that lambda 1 and lambda 2 are mutually singular this is a notation this notation is suggestive right these are these are very different right orthogonal means they are like very different right in some sense so lambda 1 and lambda 2 have nothing to do with each other for all analysis you can decompose it as you know of various measures which are mutually singular and analyze individually we will see okay so lambda 1 and lambda 2 are mutually singular can you guess the definition they have nothing to do with each other meaning the concentration is very distinct very separate so what should be the definition right as long as i say dirac delta at x not you are thinking only of x not so the other measure should be very different it should have nothing to do with x not it is concentrated somewhere else so that's the definition lambda 1 and lambda 2 are mutually singular if there are uh, two measurable sets ab which are disjoint and and lambda 1 lambda 2 concentrated on ab respectively lambda 1 is concentrated on a and lambda 2 is concentrated on b okay so this looks like lambda 1 and lambda 2 have very different behavior right they are like far apart one is concentrated on this set the other is concent only concentration matters right as as far as measure is concerned the rest is measure zero which is negligible so as far as measure is concerned where is the mass where is the center of gravity so to say okay where is the mass located so uh, lambda 1 is located on one set and lambda 2 is located on a far away set so then they are mutually singular clear so uh, here are some 6 7 properties and uh, all are you know one line proof so i have not put the proof in the slides but uh, let us go through that so let me uh, put the whole thing okay if lambda is concentrated on a then mod lambda is concentrated what is mod lambda total variation total variation total variation okay. yeah and uh, if lambda 1 and lambda 2 are mutually singular then mod lambda 1 and mod lambda 2 are mutually singular do you see a typo yes yes okay. i will correct it and if lambda 1 is lambda 1 and mu are mutually singular and lambda 2 and mu are also mutually singular then lambda 1 plus lambda 2 is and mu are mutually singular okay so these are basic properties if lambda 1 is absolutely continuous with respect to mu lambda 2 is absolutely continuous with respect to mu then the sum is absolutely continuous with respect to mu if lambda is absolutely continuous with respect to mu then total variation is absolutely continuous with respect to mu if one is absolutely continuous and the other is singular to mu then lambda 1 and lambda 2 are mutually singular and uh, this is a corollary to that so let's just quickly see okay whether these are easy or uh, we need to think okay so if lambda is concentrated on a what is the definition if e is contained in a complement then lambda of e is zero right so take e outside 
take e in a complement, you have to show that mod lambda of e is zero. How do you show that? What is the definition of mod lambda of e? What's the definition? Supremum over partitions, Some. summation mod of lambda e r, right? E i. All the e i's will also be contained in a complement. Yeah. So if e is inside a complement, all the e i's are in a complement. So lambda of e i is zero. So mod lambda of e i is zero. And whichever partition you take, the summation is zero. And you are taking supremum over zero. So that is zero. That's a proof, right? Yes. So this is easy. If lambda 1 and lambda 2 are mutually singular, then mod lambda 1 and mod lambda 2 are mutually singular. So if lambda 1 is uh, focused on A, concentrated on A, and lambda 2 is concentrated on B, there exists such A and B which are disjoint. We know that. So by the previous step, you know that mod lambda 1 is concentrated on A and mod lambda 2 is concentrated on B. A and B are anyway disjoint. So this follows, no? Yes. The same A and B which work for lambda 1 and lambda 2 work for mod lambda 1 and mod lambda 2. So this is obvious. What about this? What does this mean? This means associated to mu, there is a set A. Right? Associated to mu, there is a set A and associated to lambda 1, there is a set B such that B intersection A is empty. Right? Yeah. And lambda 2 per mu, what do you conclude? Associated to lambda 2, there is a set. What do you want to call it? C. C. Okay. And associated to mu? D. A. D. Yeah. So this is the point that I want to discuss. Is it A already or is it another D? Another D. So let's uh, check the definition once again. Uh, so this is not required. Mutually singular. We want to know the definition of mutually singular, right? So this is the definition. Lambda 1 and lambda 2 are mutually singular. If there are A and B, A intersection B is empty. With lambda 1 concentrated on A, lambda 2 concentrated on B. So it need not be the same set. No, it could be some other set also, right? Yes, sir. Because lambda 1 is changing. Yeah. So with respect to this, you get a and B, B and A, B here and A here. And with respect to this, it's a fresh start. So you get B prime and A prime. You agree? Right? Yes. There are sets disjoint. Lambda 1 is concentrated there, mu is concentrated here. Now there are again two sets disjoint. Lambda 2 is concentrated on one, mu is concentrated on the other. Concentration anyway, we said is not unique. No. So Possibly, you know, another set. OK, but doesn't matter. Where is lambda 1 plus lambda 2 naturally concentrated? If lambda 1 is concentrated on B and lambda 2 is concentrated on, let's say, D1 and D2, then lambda plus lambda 1 plus lambda 2, there's a natural set where it is concentrated. With this, think, think again. Outside B1 that. Union B2. Yeah, B1 union, union. Right? Because if you take a set which is outside B1 union, I mean in B1 union B2 complement, that is B1 complement intersection B2 complement. Both lambda 1 and lambda 2 are 0. Therefore, lambda, lambda 1 plus lambda 2 is 0. Right? On the complement, you want intersection. So you take union. Is that clear? Yes. The, in order to say that lambda 1 plus lambda 2 is 0, obvious way in which lambda 1 plus lambda 2 is 0 is by making both of them 0. Right? Other way also it may become 0 because these are complex measures. One could be the negative of the other, etc. But then it will be difficult to analyze. No. Easy way to make sum to be 0 is to make both of them 0. So if you take B1 union B2, if you take something outside B1 union B2, then it is outside B1 and outside B2. Therefore, lambda 1 is 0, lambda 2 is 0. Therefore, lambda 1 plus lambda 2 is 0. OK, and. Uh, OK, and associated to mu, you had a1 and associated to mu in the second sentence, you had a2. And what will you take here now? You would like that to be whatever set you consider should be disjoint from B1 union B2. Yes, sir. So what will you take? 
So mu is right. You have to give two sets which are disjoint and lambda one plus lambda two concentrated on one and uh, mu is concentrated on the other. So here we can't take union. Yeah, well, if you take union, what will happen? Lambda one plus lambda two is concentrated on B one union B two. And uh, if you take uh, A one union A two, it need not be disjoint. Yes, sir. Why not? Yeah, because B1 and A2 you can't compare, so it need not be disjoint. But if you take uh, if you take one of the A1 or A2, is that good enough? No, right? Because B1 union B2 intersection A1 is B1 intersection A1, which is empty. But B2 take intersection both. A1 you don't know. Take but what if you take A1 intersection A2? Then intersection is empty. Disjoint, both are disjoint, but union is X or not. B1 union B2 is disjoint from A1 intersection A2, no? Yes, sir, because B1 is disjoint from A1 and B2 is disjoint yeah. from A2. That is okay, but is it true that mu is concentrated on A1 intersection A2? Yes, sir, mu is concentrated on B1, mu is concentrated on B2, so concentrated on, on B1, B2 or B1 in B1 it is in B2 also because this is subset of B2. Subset of B1, B2. Hello? I think sir has lost the network. What happened? I think sir has lost the internet. Yes. Let's no. bet. Hi, so can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. I will my watch by phone to pass the message because WhatsApp also did not work. So, uh, yeah, this is the first time in between it goes, but this is the first time it's happening uh, during the class. Yeah, so. Uh, uh, can you see my slides or I have to? Everything goes when power goes. Okay. So what do you see now? Are we on the right page? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. And uh, what happens to recording? Still going. Yeah. Sorry, it is. Still is recording. it the same recording as earlier? Yes. Yes, sir. It shows 38 minutes. Yeah. So all of you must have been there on the recording, right? 
the idle pouch. Okay, let's see. So uh, fine. So yeah, so we 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 corresponding to this and have to be to B1 union B2, right? And uh, A1 intersection A2. Intersection is empty is OK, but what about uh, concentration? Is it true that mu is concentrated on A1 intersection A2? So you have to take something outside A1 intersection A2, right? Yes. Right, you have to take E contained in A1 intersection A2 complement, no? Are you there? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes, so you have to take uh, E contained in A1 intersection A2 hall complement, right? And yes. then you have to see what mu of E is. So if you take A1 intersection A2 complement, what is it? It is A1 complement union A2 complement, right? Yes. And you are taking E contained in A1 complement union A2 complement. So what can you say about mu of E? Contained in A1 complement and A2 complement, no? Then sir, mu of E may not be zero because. Why not? Some, some part of E may be in A1 complement and some part of E. Ah, but that's OK, right? Some part of E is, you are right. So some part of E is in A1 complement and uh, other part of E is in a2 complement. Suppose that's the case. Then the part of E which is in A1 complement, their measure is zero, right? Similarly, the part which is in A2 complement, their also measure is zero. But but are they will be measurable or not? measurable sets? What is mu for us? Mu is a positive measure. Lambda one and lambda two are arbitrary measures. OK, so even if it is not measurable. Even if it is not measurable, see A1 is a measurable set, right? By definition, right? When we defined uh, concentrated, A belongs to M. So A1 and A2 are measurable. Therefore, A1 complement and A2 complement are measurable. And mu of A1 complement is zero, right? Yes. Yes. And therefore, mu of that that part of E inside A1 complement is zero by monotonicity of mu. Yes. So, are we taking complete measure or any? No, we are not taking complete. Uh, but yeah, you have a point. Part of E which belongs to. Yeah. So the question is. Can you say measure zero if the set is not measurable, right? Yes. Okay, so uh, E is contained in A1 complement, union A2 complement. Oh, by the way, maybe we can conclude a bit more. See, earlier when we discussed concentration, that set need not be unique. No, Thereby, sir. It will be measurable because the part of E which is contained in A1 complement will be E intersection with A1 complement. So that will be measurable. Uh, OK, OK, pa that is correct. Part yes. of E which is contained in A1 complement is E inter absolutely E intersection A1 complement, right? Yeah, so that's e right. So that is measurable. Very good. So A1 complement is measurable, E is measurable, so that is measurable. So mu of that is zero. Similarly, the part which is contained in A2 complement, also yeah. it is zero, and that's enough, no? Yeah. yeah. Because even if that was not disjoint, it's okay, right? Even if we can make a disjoint. disjoint, it's okay because subadditivity is always there. Yes. So it is okay. So A1 intersection A2 will work. 
so therefore uh, this is okay lambda 1 plus lambda 2 is mutually singular to mu absolutely continuous so uh, we have to start with an e such that mu of e is zero right and we are asking whether lambda 1 plus lambda 2 is zero now that's obvious because from what is given mu of e is zero therefore lambda 1 of e is zero and lambda 2 of e is zero therefore lambda 1 plus lambda 2 of e is zero clear is obvious what about this if mu of e is zero you have to show that mod lambda of e is zero so this is okay because it's supremum over partitions of modulus yes. of lambda of ei and if lambda mu of e is zero uh, then lambda of e is zero and therefore lambda of ei is zero therefore that supremum is zero this is also okay so here we have, <laughs> what is interesting is it's all easy to prove but it is to remember the correct properties whenever we need okay and what about this if lambda 1 is absolutely continuous with respect to mu and lambda 2 is mutually singular to mu then lambda 1 and lambda 2 are mutually singular this is like what i said earlier right uh, mutually singular meaning you can focus on this part so absolutely continuous and mutually singular are extreme notions one is on one end and the other is on the other end that's what this shows so how do you do this you take uh, you have to show that lambda 1 and lambda 2 are mutually singular. So you have to give disjoint sets on which uh, it is uh, concentrated, right? What is given to you is lambda 2 and mu are mutually singular. So associated to mu there is A and associated to lambda 2 there is B and B and A are distinct, disjoint, right? Now if mu of A is, no. So from lambda, so can you conclude if mu is concentrated on A, can you conclude lambda 1 is concentrated on A? If mu is concentrated on A, then I claim lambda 1 is concentrated on A. Why is that? Because yes, if you take any set outside A, if you take any set in A complement, you have to show that lambda 1 of A is 0. But their mu of e is zero, and therefore lambda yes. one of e is zero. Yes, yes. Okay. So if lambda one is absolutely continuous with respect to mu, and mu is concentrated on a set, then lambda one is also concentrated on the same set, and therefore this follows, right? If you have b and a here, lambda one is focused on a, therefore b intersection a is anyway b intersection a is empty, therefore this follows. And the last one is if lambda is both absolutely continuous with respect to mu and singular to mu, then lambda has to be the zero measure. That is because you know that lambda is, yeah, from the previous line, itself. Lambda 1 equal to lambda 2, equal to lambda. Therefore, lambda is mutually singular to lambda. What does that mean? There is A and B disjoint says that lambda is focused on A and B is concentrated, lambda is concentrated on B also. Right? But A is in B complement. Therefore, lambda of A has to be 0. B is an A complement, therefore lambda of B also has to be zero. So lambda is zero everywhere. Yes. Okay. So how many? Six or seven properties? Seven. Seven. Six or six or seven. seven properties. Okay. So that's all that we will do today. I want to recall uh, one more thing, which is that you remember the definition of sigma compact and sigma finite? What is sigma compact? What is sigma compact? X can be written as union of countable union of compact. Countable union of compact sets. And under the conditions of RRT, sigma compact implied sigma finite. Sigma finite would be countable union of sets of finite measure. And this is why this is just recalling. We don't need it today. Why sigma compact implies sigma finite? Because compact set has major finite. Under, because, under the conditions of RRT. And we also showed that sigma finite sets are inner regular. You remember this? Yes. yes OK, yes. so the, I, since I copy pasted the quick proof, let's just recall we don't need all this. E is union EI, where EI is a finite measure. And uh, yeah, so E is a sigma finite set, and we have to show that E can be approximated from below by compact sets. 
So you can assume u of e is infinity. Why? Because otherwise, uh, otherwise, otherwise it's, it's in a regular, right? Yeah. Because uh, yeah. under the conditions of RRT only, so finite finite measure sets are in MF, and they are by definition in a regular. So EIs are also disjoint. You can assume, and uh, each EI is in a regular, and uh, therefore uh, the definition is true. And we did some approximation. Okay. Anyway, we proved this long back. Okay. I, I did not want to delete this part because I thought, you know, let's we, we can just recall. So we did something and uh, point is finite union of compact sets is compact and you are getting it as a limit of that. So this was the proof. Okay, But anyway, I just want to show a sigma finite lemma and we will stop there. It's easy, but it's important. So you have a measure space where mu is a positive measure. OK. And the title of the slide has sigma finite. So what is the extra condition? Mu is also sigma mu finite. Is also sigma finite. Okay. So excess union E n where mu of E n is finite. Finite. This is given to you. Okay. Now I'm going to so the 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 lemma, the statement of the lemma is last line. You take these functions. If x belongs to E n, you consider that particular thing. And x outside u n, e n you consider zero. Consider these functions and take the sum. Convergence is not a problem, no? Right? Because why is it not a problem? Because WN is a non zero function, right? It cannot be zero when X is in EN, no? Yes. Because of sigma finiteness, right? Because mu EN is finite. Now, summation WN, now am I using the fact EN is a disjoint? I don't think I'm using that. You don't need that, no? Summation WN, if X belongs to Yes, that is anyway in demand. It's convergent anyway, whether you assume in this or not. Yeah, I don't want this join just a second. I'll just call you back. My class will be over in five minutes. <laughs> Bye. So uh, W is summation WN and uh, tell me why will it be convergent? Because uh, summation is less than summation one by two n, always. Ah, because one plus mu n is bigger than one. Yeah, it is less than one by two n always. So convergence is not a problem. And uh, what else can you say about W? Is it an integrable function? Is it an L one mu? What is integral of W? It will be summation integral of W n by interchanging. And integral of W n is finite, right? In yeah, fact, integral of W n also yeah. your previous observation is true. No, it is less than one by two power n, right? Yes. And therefore, the, that sum also converges. Summation integral W n also converges. No. Yes, sir. Same. So W is in L one mu, and uh, uh, W is bounded by one is also okay. No, by whatever you have claimed, because summation one by yes, two sir. power n is one. So what you have concluded is W is in L1 mu and for every X in X, W X is between 0 and 1. Strictly bigger than 0 and strictly less than 1. That's exactly the point. 1 by 1 plus mu EN is strictly less than 1. So summation 1 by 2 power N is strictly less than 1. Okay, and why is it strictly bigger than 0? Because mu EN is never infinity. Right? Yes. yes. So you have got this, and this is going to be very useful because whenever you know Radon Nikodim is for sigma finite measures, okay. And in any other theorem, whenever you have sigma finite, what will be your first statement? First statement will be without loss of generality or something like that. You will work with finite measures. Why? Because if there is a sigma finite measure, you will take W D mu with respect to this W. So what this lemma is telling you is given a positive measure mu. There is an associated function W with this condition in L1 mu. Okay, 
So you can take the new measure WD mu, and that's actually a finite measure. Yes. This is a finite measure. Not only that, the most important point I forgot, I will add that before putting it on Moodle. That's the important point in this note. Not that it's a finite measure, which is obvious. This measure phi and this measure mu have the same sets of measure zero. If mu of E is zero, then phi of E is zero. If phi of E is zero, then mu of E is zero. Because W is strictly positive. OK. Right? If phi of E is zero, then mu of E is zero because W cannot vanish. If mu of E is zero, of course, then phi of E is zero. Yes. OK. So this we are going to use many times. That uh, many sigma finite arguments we will convert to. Finite measure arguments. OK, so uh, next class we will do Radin Nicodium, which is on Wednesday, but we are meeting on Monday, right? For this uh, extra class. Yes, 11 30, right? Say that again. Monday and the same time means 11 30. But uh, one of you, maybe Akshay, uh, just uh, message on uh, WhatsApp. Yes. Okay, yeah. okay all right. Uh, I can also stop recording.